I'm like, wow, like, I'm so excited. We win on those. Look at your plans and change that. Okay, you would see V reasonable. This is always my favorite thing. I, I, oh, I'm actually, I, I, guys, I'm, I'm actually shocked, folks. I'm following through the slides. Like, this is like the first time ever. This is the first. Just so everyone know you were here for the first time, Adam Russo followed every slide. It says, the good news is that you'll be a real money maker for us. And that's the reality of it, folks. <laughs> You would see V reasonable, all right? Here's my thing. You see this guy? This is not my friend, but he looks like my friend, okay? I call this the UNC garage. I got a buddy of mine, Robert Witterowski. We call him Wiki, Polish kid. And Wiki owns a, is, is a mechanic here on, well, I live in Boston. He lives on the North Shore. North Shore, like that? North Shore. North is that better? North Shore. North Shore. Okay. He lives on the North Shore in Tossfield, okay? And Wiki, has two other mechanics that are in his town. All right, all three of these guys on a Friday night get together at the Polish club in Dorchester, where I live, where I grew up, and we all hang out there. And you know what they do? They laugh about how much they ripped all you folks off. Okay, what Wiki does? Wiki doesn't fix foreign cars at all, but his shop says we fix everything. What happens is the other guy down the street who fixes the Audi and the BMW drives over to Wiki's with a tow truck, takes that car, brings it to his shop down the street, fixes it. Brings it back to Roberts, and Robert gets paid. Guy gets a cut. Everyone's happy, and they talk about how they always rip all their customers off because they're all the only three mechanics in their little town. The only three, and Wiki's probably one of the best-looking guys around. Women, like all those women, they flock to Wiki's shop. They all are just hanging out, talking to him. They're there all day. You know, he's got his bandana on. You know, he's cool, like Ed back in the day with his bandana. <laughs> Ed, I'm sorry, man. That's all right. I love you. He used to wear a band. I know. I saw it in his office. But anyways, so the whole point I'm saying is, guess what, folks? Your plan docs, you know what they say? Your plan docs say U, C, and R. U, R, and C. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Usual, reasonable, customary. You throw it all in there together. It's like a soup. Alphabet soup. U, C, R. U, R, C. Everybody here has that. So guess what? Take my buddy Wiki down as an example. When he charges $200 to fix brakes that should only cost $100, and his other guy in this town charges $200 to fix those same brakes, and the third guy in town charges, third guy in town charges $200 to fix those brakes, aren't they all charging what's usual? Aren't they all charging what's customary? We've always been charging $200. And therefore, if it's usual and it's customary, then it's reasonable. That's what our industry does. If you don't understand anything about health insurance, understand Wiki's scheme. <laughs> what he's doing is usual and it's customary, and because your plan doc says so, it's even reasonable. You're allowing Wiki to do what he's doing. You're defining in your plan specifically what, what Wiki wants to do. What you need to do, folks, is split them up. Take reasonable out of the equation. Just because it's usual and it's customary, just because Wiki rips everybody off on breaks by 100 bucks every time they walk in there doesn't make it reasonable, doesn't make it right. But we're defining it as that's what it is right. We can't do that any, any longer. What you need to do is take the definition of reasonableness and separate it from what's usual and customary. Have its own definition, separate. This will allow you not only to challenge bills, it will allow you not only to have the right to audit a bill, it will allow you the right to recover on an overpayment. It will allow you the right to recover on a never event. Because a never event basically means one thing. It's a service that wasn't reasonable. It wasn't needed. It never should have happened. If it never should have happened, it's not a reasonable event. I only pay on reasonable things. And it's not reasonable for you to have to charge me for a broken leg because you dropped the guy in the hospital room. I was supposed to pay for that guy to have open heart surgery, and now I'm paying for his open heart surgery, and I'm paying for a cast on his leg because your nurses dropped the guy. It's not reasonable. That's how you get around your never event, folks. It's like I said, you don't put the word never event in your plan, you don't need to. These are the kind of things that we should be able to do. So, like I mentioned, don't limit UNC to charges by similar providers. Expand your area with a cross-section representation. Make sure you have other sources. Medicare cost to charge ratios. 
Everyone here deals with MGUs. How much time do I have? 30 minutes. Okay. Everyone here deals with MGUs, right? MGUs are, in my mind, some of the most innovative companies out in our industry right now. They're small, they're mobile, they're quick, they can do a lot of things. What they do, though, they'll say, okay, you know what, we're going to reimburse only on Medicare Plus. Well, what if your plan that doesn't allow that? You've got to make sure that your brokers that your plan, that your plans hire, and we all have those brokers, but those brokers are looking at that stop loss contract and actually reading it and what it says is going to reimburse on. What I've been seeing, and again, these are all trends that Glenn was talking about earlier. These are just trends that I see from the plan doc, from the legal side of things. What you're seeing a lot of is more and more stop loss contracts or MGU type contracts which are saying how much they're going to reimburse you. They're not just going to reimburse you whatever you paid. They're going to reimburse you with the caveat. That caveat being what, you have, what you've paid for that claim meets the definition of usual and customary. And separately, what's reasonable because those guys have been listening to my speeches for many years and they already put that stuff on their plan. So what, they have been, what they've been doing is I've been seeing more and more situations where a stop loss carrier will go back or an MGU will go back to the TPA and say, hey, you pay this claim at 97% of charges and it's $300,000 bill? Sorry, I'm not reimbursing you. Why? I have an exclusion in my stop loss contract. And that exclusion specifically says what? I'm not going to pay you above U and C. What are you going to do when your plan language defines U, C, and R as all one big mumble jumble thing. You got no case, that plan's gone, that plan is never gonna be self-funded again, that plan has gone over to the Bukas forever. And that's another client that we'll never have. Not just you, but you and you and you. And that's what I love about Taba, is that I, the first time I came here, I was like, man, how are all these competitors all like hanging out together? And they're all drinking together, and dancing, and talking, and... <laughs> Don't they all hate each other? Because back in Massachusetts, we had like four TPAs. These guys hate each other. It's despised. They despise each other. I mean, when I say despise, I mean despise. I can't even tell one that I represent the other. You know, I can't say anything. One time, one woman, I'm sorry guys, I just can't talk about this all the time. What? There was one woman who worked for a TPA. She was at this TPA and she got a job at another TPA, okay? And then she left that TPA and came to work for me, right? Four years later. Well, she wrote an email from my office to this, the first TPA. The woman, the owner, calls me up. Adam, that woman works for you. I never want her to see any of my accounts. Flipping out. Why? Because she might tell the other TPA some of our, you know, innovative ideas. I'm thinking, what ideas could possibly she tell? <laughs> like, I haven't seen any innovation out of your plan in 10 years working with you. I say that. But that's the kind of things that happen back home, okay? You guys don't have that here. But back to what I want to, back to this. The main things, folks, is you want to have definitions in your plan, Doc, that really will look for innovate, look, look to innovate, defend the plan, defend the, what the plan is paying, and then get to back that up so you can help, it can help you with your balance building issues. Because like I said, eight out of ten times, the problem is our own doing. It's our own making. And we can stop that. Clean claims. If you don't have it now, make sure you put it in. Here's the thing that people always get asked, and I'm sure I'm going to talk about it tomorrow a little bit. People always bring up the fact, Adam, now with this whole new healthcare reform and all this grandfathering, can we make changes to the plan? Or is it now a new plan? And if it's a new plan, then we're subject to the grandfathering provisions. Fact of the matter is, folks, you can make amendments to your plan without calling it a new plan. I think it's one of the things that we talked about last week. The people at SIA really haven't, we don't, we don't have all the answers. It's to be determined as almost everything else that was discussed at SIA last, uh, when we talked to people at SIA last week. But the bottom line is, you know, you can change your co-pays in your plan without changing the plan, without doing it in a restatement. It'd be an amendment. So everything that we've seen allows you to still work your plans like you normally would, still have amendments to your plan, whether it's a new PPO that you want to work with or a new medical transplant network that you might want to work with. Whatever. A new stop loss carrier that might, you might want to work with. But the bottom line, folks, is this is probably one of the most important things you have to look at. And what this is, is defining in your plan what it means for a claim to be clean. It can't just be that a claim comes into your office and has a person's name and a couple diagnosis codes and a, a CPT code, and that's it. You need to know that if you need additional information for that particular claim to be paid, that the claim is not clean until you have that information. The clock doesn't start ticking for that PPO contract until you know that it's a payable claim. Doesn't that make any sense? 
then none of us do it. It just makes sense to me that if, for you to pay that claim, for it to be payable, it shouldn't just be 30 days from when you receive it. What if you can't get the information? And everyone here has been in that situation. What if you just can't get the info? People will say, well, the stop loss carrier won't reimburse me if I don't pay the claim by the end of the stop loss year. I guarantee you folks, if you pick up the phone and call your stop loss representative and told them, hey, I got a $300,000 claim. I'm trying to get this claim knocked down by $150,000. Can you extend my contract for me? They're not going to say no. You got to pick up the phone and ask them. But they're not going to say no. And the days of people saying that shouldn't be happening anymore. Because people are getting smarter about these things. You can't just say, stop loss won't reimburse me if I don't pay by December 31st, so I'm going to close my eyes and just reimburse whatever they wanted. No, stop loss carriers and the MGUs will allow you to extend that period of time. There's no question of that. Especially if you go to your carriers and tell them, guess what? I just redefined all my language. I got better plan, better plan terms that will allow us to do a better job. I guarantee if you do that, folks, you might be able to get better pricing from your stop loss and MGU carriers that you work with. There's no question about that. You have a question? Um, I mean, it's nice, but it doesn't change the fact that the PPOs don't attack the plan, the PPO, the PPOs attack the contractual language that either the TPA or the employer has been stupid enough to sign that says this is a clean claim. And you can, you can call whatever you want in your plan document. I'll go five slides ahead. I'll answer your question. Oh, you got my You got that. No, no worries. Let, uh, let me jump in for yeah. a second. I just wanted to add something to what Adam was just saying, and that is almost universally across the stop loss market, um, they have begun to contract with claims negotiators on in network claims. Yep. So um, you are going to see a much higher level of recognition of. Um, a willingness to go and negotiate those claims and try to get those claims reduced with the provider. So this language that Adam's talking about is absolutely essential, as is a process in place for contacting the stop loss carrier as you're getting towards the end of the policy year to make sure that any agreements around those claims are documented fully. To add to what Glenn was saying, you know, like in the past, it used to be the stop loss contracts, they would want, the stop loss carriers would want a sign subrogation form. They moved beyond that. This is where they're at. And I can tell you, not only do they hire, and this is a growing trend, they're not taking the claim to one audit company. They're taking that same claim to seven audit companies, and whoever gives them the best discount on that claim is who they go with. And they will tell you, as a TPA, that they're going to reimburse you that amount. And it's happening right now. Yes, sir. What about the situation, though, where a lot of the networks are coming back and saying, we have a contract with the you have to reimburse the network level, or we're going to cancel you? Right. I've had that situation happen to me. I'm going to get into that in a couple slides, the same as him. Just give me one second, I'll answer that question directly. Cast of characters, so I'm going to get into the PPO conflicts. But the cast of characters, that, which ties into what the PPO contracts are, you see the PPO's right there. MGU's there. I call this the octopus slide. <laughs> You get all these different tentacles with all these different people involved on every one of your big, on every one of your large claims. This is exactly who's involved. And there's me in the bottom, the, the, the cost containment vendor or attorney who's dealing with these situations. But that's exactly what's happening. Everyone knows what goes on. Everyone knows what the PPOs will do, what the broker does, what the hospital does. I'm not going to get into all that so I can answer your questions directly. But because of that, here's the problem to get into what you're talking about, and it's called Mind the Gap. Anyone who's been to London has seen these signs in the subway, right? The little gap between the, the subway and the